There we go. Good evening, everybody. Welcome, welcome back to the Mythgard Academy. This is our 16th and penultimate session on Sauron Defeated. We are totally going to finish this book next week. <clears throat> this will be our second to last session. Um, and I'm going to warn you in advance that I am not going to go through the notes on the Adonaic language very carefully. I mean, I'll, we'll, we'll talk about it uh, some, but I'm not, we're not going to walk through that in meticulous detail. Um, that is, uh, the linguistic stuff has never been my expertise, and I'm not going to embarrass myself trying to talk too much about it. But I will de we'll definitely go through and see. Um, you know, there may be some things that I think are really interesting and that I want to point out from a, a sort of a narrative or creative process standpoint. But um, uh, but we're likely I'm likely to skim through that last section pretty quickly. For me, the focal point of the uh, end of the book of the last session that we're going to do next time is the uh, the part which uh, Christopher has so tantalizingly titled the theory of the work. Right. Oh man, that's what I'm all. That's what I'm all about. So, uh, uh, so we'll see. When you know, uh, uh, notes on uh, what Tolkien was trying to do and what he was projecting. That's what I love. So we'll see about that. We'll do that next time. Anyway, um, so uh, yeah. Okay. So tonight uh, we're gonna go through. Um, I'm gonna see if we can go, finish going through both uh, the first two versions of the Drowning of Anadune, which I think is a really, really interesting. Uh, text. Um, there's so many ways in which uh, the drowning of Anadune really seems to bring forward an entirely new. I mean, I'm tempted to say something like an entirely new epoch in in Tolkien's creative thinking. And one of the things that I'm really kind of wondering now. Um, I totally understand why Christopher Tolkien decided to separate this stuff out, right? Remember, he, this is all happening. The Notion Club papers, the drowning of Anadune is all happening, is all happening during one of the, um, uh, one of the, uh, gaps in time, right? When he set the Lord of the Rings aside and didn't work on it for like over a year. Um, it would be really tempting, um, to, um, take, to have read this stuff, in the context of that, right? So for him to have interrupted the history of the Lord of the Rings to give us this stuff and then go back to the history of the Lord of the Rings at the end. Again, I totally understand why he didn't do that because the history of the Lord of the Rings is a sort of a separately packageable thing, right? Um, but to me, the Drowning of Anadune, the Notion Club papers really, and the Drowning of Anadune really taken together um, are such a, I mean, you can see this whole new, this whole new level, right? This entirely new perspective uh, on his mythology, on on his world building, right? Um, and I would love to see a little bit more clearly to have uh, kind of processed that, right? In the context of um, the composition of the Lord of the Rings, how was the writing of the Lord of the Rings and the mo the movement um, of the um, of the Lord of the, of the Lord of the Rings material and, and, and narrative. How was that influenced? Um, when he goes back from this stuff and begins the Lord of the Rings again, where can we see it? Right. How can we see it? Cause I would think we'd almost have to, right. Um, anyway, so that's one thing that I kind of miss, as I say, totally understand why he did it this way. And I'm grateful for however he did it. But, um, uh, but that is one thing I was certainly kind of thinking about and wondering about. Um, anyway, let me do some quick announcements, uh, and then, uh, we'll get back, uh, to the text. So of course, announcements this weekend is middle moot, right? Uh, middle moot is just in a couple days. I'm getting ready, you know, early, early Friday morning before dawn, I'm going to be leaving to uh, catch a plane and head out to Iowa, uh, for middle moot. Um, there is still an opportunity for you to get your, um, uh, your tickets if you want to come. Um, there, the registration is going to be open all the way up until the uh, the event. So it's not too late. If you're in the area, come join us. It's going to be awesome. Uh, Ted Naismith, the Tolkien artist, is going to be there. Uh, wonderful work. Uh, great guy. If you've never had a chance to meet him before, he's been to Myth Mood a couple times, actually. So I know many of you have had the chance to, uh, to meet him. Uh, but if you haven't, this is a really, really wonderful opportunity. Um, so... Um, 
yeah. Anyway, so that's going to be great. I can't wait to go to uh, it, it was funny. I was just uh, chatting with someone else who's coming to, to uh, Middlemoot uh, yesterday and she was saying Middlemoot, it's like a it's it's like a family reunion that I look forward to going to. <laughs> right? And that's definitely how I feel about the regional moots and especially, you know, Middlemoot was our one of our very first uh, regional moots. It's like a you know first generation regional moot. Um, this is our third middle moot now that we're having this year. Um, so certainly um, the uh, the regionals start to feel like that right after several years. Uh, looking forward to getting to see uh, folks again from the area who come in. Uh, so I certainly am looking forward to that. Uh, the second thing I wanted to remind you of uh, is Mythgard Movie Club tomorrow night, 8.30 p.m. Eastern Time. Um, they're going to be talking about Pan's Labyrinth, which is an awesome, really, really interesting movie. Um, so I hope you can join the Mythgard Movie Club folks uh, for that tomorrow night, Thursday night. Uh, that is October 10th. Um, and uh, uh, one... Uh, Okay, two more things, two more things. Uh, last thing, so I've been talking about Magnolia Moot down in Charlotte, which is uh, which was coming up soon. We've had all manner of problems uh, getting our venue uh, organized and everything down there. We've had a number of delays and false starts there. Um, so we've actually decided to postpone that because we were getting like way, way too rushed and too last minute putting that together. And we want to make sure everybody has the opportunity not only to plan to come if you're uh, you know, down there in the southeast, um, but also to be able to present if you're interested in presenting. So um, we're going to um, we're going to postpone uh, the, uh, uh, the Magnolia moot, um, from, uh, uh, so it's not going to be, you know, beginning of November, end of October. It's going to be April. Actually, we're going to push that forward to April. So it's going to, it's a pretty significant shift. We're pushing it forward six months. Um, but again, I think it'll be much better. Um, if you're thinking about coming to Magnolia moot, I'll give you a save the date. Uh, I think we're going to be looking at April 18th, Saturday, April 18th, um, which is the Saturday after Easter. Um, so that's, I think, what we're going to be looking at for Magnolia Moot. I uh, hope uh, you guys will be able to... Uh, so again, and, and we're pretty sure one of the, one of the benefits of uh, uh, all the wrangling with, ven with venues that we've been doing is that we already, you know, we're in discussions with them. So it was pretty quick for us to settle on a date six months down the road and come in again, right? Uh, which is what we're going to do with Magnolia Mood. So that's been pushed off until uh, April. April 18th uh, is the probable date. So again, if you're in the Southeast, I hope you'll be able to uh, to come to that. Um, uh, regional Moots are wonderful. This is the second time we're doing Magnolia Moot. Uh, and again, it's going to be in Charlotte, North Carolina on the 18th of April. So I hope you can uh, you can join us there. And Bay Moot is also coming up. This is our second annual Bay Moot out in the San Francisco Bay Area. Uh, and uh, that is good. We don't have uh, the registration isn't posted for that yet, but that's going to be uh, on November 23rd. So uh, coming up soon. All right. Uh, the last announcement, of course, is that we are still doing our fall fundraising campaign. If you haven't had the opportunity yet to make your tax deductible donation to Signum University, I really hope that you will consider uh, doing that. Um, we are uh, our goal for the annual fund this year is seventy thousand uh, dollars to to help Signum continue to move forward. Um, we have already raised forty six thousand dollars towards that seventy thousand dollars in gifts and pledges for the coming year. Um, so that is extremely exciting. We're we're moving right along, uh, and I hope that you can help to help us uh, kind of push over the top there uh, in achieving our our, our fundraising goals, uh, so that we can continue to move forward. I don't know if you've had a chance, if you've all had a chance to uh, watch or listen to this uh, State of the University address that I gave on Monday. Day, uh, two days ago. Uh, you can find it, especially those of you who go to Twitch, the easiest place to find it right now. Um, go to our Twitch channel, look at our videos, uh, the, our, the, the videos on demand there, um, and you can see there's a, there's a, a permanent link to the, to the um, State of the University there. Um, and uh, that's where I revealed our plans for uh, Signum in the, over, over the next few years. Really sort of the next step forward, the next generation of Signum and how I see our, our program gr growing and the way, the path that I see us following uh, in order to, um, uh, to really make an impact uh, on, uh, for people and on higher education. So uh, it was pretty, 
pretty exciting time. We don't plan to dominate the entire world, Stephen. We're just trying to help as many people as we possibly can. Um, but uh, uh, yeah, Dominion. No, we're we're turning away from Dominion, right? <laughs> uh, uh, Noli Episcopari for us, but uh, but but no, we are. Uh, it is really exciting, and I'm I'm uh, uh, very very eager uh, to take our next steps forward, as I was describing in that. Anyway. All of these things are, are all made possible. Our existence, our continued existence and our existence to this point um, has all been made possible by you guys and your generosity. So uh, I just I ask you again to consider doing that if you haven't. Setting up a monthly donation is really easy. Even a small monthly donation of just a few dollars a month or, you know, ten dollars or 15 a month um, is really um, uh, very impactful over time. Um, uh, but of course. We take one-time donations there as well. Um, but um, anyway, so uh, uh, and the last thing I wanted to mention concerning the fundraiser, I talked about this before, but I wanted to re remind you, if you have made a donation, we're going to do another drawing, an asynchronous drawing from our uh, uh, all of the people who have donated uh, to Signum and who are you know, sort of supporting the Mythgard Academy uh, specifically. So if you have made a donation... Um, just all you have to do, just send an email to donate at signumu.org and just mention that you would like to enter the drawing uh, for the Mythgard Academy because we are going to draw three names from the list of people, uh, uh, donors who email us and let us know that they'd like to, you know, they're just, just sort of mentioning the Mythgard Academy, um, you know, that you heard about this here. And uh, we'll, enter, we'll enter you in that drawing. We'll, we'll draw three winners. The three winners will get um, uh, a choice of the courses that we have. So you get access to, to one of our courses of your choice. And the grand prize winner will get that and will also get a special Mythgard Academy prize. And the Mythgard Academy grand prize is that you will get a free nomination. You can choose a book or you know, a work of your choice to go straight into the um, finalist pool for our next election. Uh, so that's, uh, uh, that's, that's pretty cool. Like you, it doesn't automatically win, right? It still has to compete in the final election with everything else, but you get to, to, to bypass the first level of elections and just put it straight into the finalist pool. So, uh, so there you go. All right. Um, those are the reminders that I wanted to give you. And thank you again to everyone who has donated. As I say, it is just, uh, it's a huge deal. It's a huge deal. All right. Um, I wanted to start tonight by making a confession. And that confession is, as I was going through Christopher's notes to the drowning of Anna Dunai, right? I often, um, when I'm reading through, the, uh, you know, uh, these volumes, you know, the history of the Lord of the Rings, I often don't, I mean, unless I'm like something is spe specially piquing my curiosity, I don't usually read the end notes as I go. I, I usually just kind of run through them at the end. Um, sometimes I regret doing that, but usually I don't. Um, so, you know, here I'm reading the uh, the first two versions of the drowning of Anadune, and then we get to the notes at the end, and or rather the commentary at the end really is the the place that I'm talking about, and I'm reading Christopher's commentary at the end, and I'm like, okay, it seems to me like one of two things is happening, right? Either I'm going crazy, or Christopher Tolkien is missing the absolute obvious, right? And I'm like. And I'm like, and I, I'm like, I can't imagine that Christopher Tolkien hasn't noticed this, like hasn't observed this. Now, Aslan's Compass, it is certainly possible that both could be true. I can't rule that out. Um, uh, anyway, let me let me show you what I an example of what I mean. So this is a commentary uh, on the the beginning of the first version of the Drowning of Anna Dune. The line that the note is for is some said that they were children of the Avaloi and did not die. Referring of course to the elves. So in section 16, the Nimri are called without any qualification of some said the children of the deathless folk, uh, cross reference the opening of the Quintus Silmarillion in volume five. And then here's the passage from the opening of the Quintus Silmarillion. Uh, this is, this is the 1937 Quintus Silmarillion um, that we read in the lost road volume. 
These spirits the elves name the Valar, which is the powers, and men have often called them gods. Many lesser spirits of their own kind they brought in their train, both great and small, and some of these men have confused with the elves, but wrongly. For they were made before the world, whereas elves and men awoke first in the world after the coming of the Valar. Though not mentioned in this passage, the conception of the children of the Valar is frequently encountered in the Quenta Silmarillion, and cross-reference especially the later annals of Valinor, with these great ones came many lesser spirits, beings of their own kind but of smaller might, and with them also were later numbered their children. Okay, so I'm reading these notes, right? And I'm just like getting more and more uncomfortable, because he's glossing this the passage in the text where the point of view of the narrative is that the elves are the children of the valar right and i'm reading that right so do, without forgetting his note for a second right i'm just reading the text i'm like the elves are the children of the valar and i'm like oh yeah that's really interesting right so i, I mean it's perfectly obvious right that uh the drowning of anadune is being written from the human point of view right that this is like a human myth, especially in the context um, of the uh, Notion Club papers, right? With the whole, you know, conception as we get it there, as Loudham presents it to us through his visions and stuff, right? Of like how the uh, the memory of Numenor gets passed down through like Gothic and Anglo-Saxon and everything else, right? You know, and and the whole what, King Horn, or King she not King Horn, King Sheev, right? Um, uh, and again, so all of those legends and things that we're seeing, and so. The drowning of Anadune, it, again, it seemed clear that that's what was happening here, right? That when we got things which seemed weird, like, again, that simple thing at the beginning, um, the deathless ones, the elves, the lesser deathless ones are the children of the Avaloi, right? That they're the children of the Valar. And again, so I'm like, okay, that's interesting, right? It's, I mean, it makes sense that, you know, the humans would think that not only that they're in cahoots together, right, but that they're actually related. I mean, because they kind of look like us, but they're not like us, and they don't look, I mean, there are differences between them and us, and they're more glorious, and they're immortal, and we're not. And so it's clear that we're not, like, distantly related to each other, elves and men, so, like, it makes perfect sense. We've got the deathless ones who live beyond the sea. They're probably their kids. So thinking about it in that context, thinking about it as, uh, you know, um, that he is putting himself outside of the frame of reference that he was using in all of his previous Silmarillion material, right, which is very elf-centric, and he's giving us the completely human-centric version of the myth, right? So as I'm reading it, I'm like, okay, yeah, awesome. Like I'm getting this, like I'm oriented to this. This is interesting. And then I read these notes and I'm like, C C Christopher, wait, hang on. Why, why are we talking about this? Why are we talking about the children of the Valar? Like, and how the, because that, this isn't about the children of the Valar. Right. Um, not mentioned, though not mentioned in this passage, the conception of the children of the Valar is frequently encountered. I'm like, well, yeah, but wait, hang on. It's like it's like, are you trying to Christopher, are you trying to reconcile these two things? Are you trying to suggest that the mythology of the drowning of Anadune is the same as the other mythology? Right. And trying to show to, trying to harmonize these two things, because because that doesn't make sense, actually. Uh, not only does that not make sense, but again, it just seems obviously counter to the creative project that Tolkien is undertaking in this text, right? So I'm reading these notes and I'm like, um, um, okay. Again, like either I'm totally, cause like it, this seems so obvious to me that I'm like, if I, it's not just that if I'm wrong, I'm dumb. It's like, if I'm wrong, I'm crazy. Right. I, I don't understand, but surely, surely Christopher hasn't missed that. Right. Surely Christopher's. I mean, there have been a couple times when reading Christopher's notes that I think he's kind of gotten himself into a kink of like he, he looks at the text from this sort of one initial assumption and kind of it, 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 and that it sways his interpretation of what's going on. There have been a couple times when I've hesitantly suggested that Christopher's kind of missing the boat on what Tolkien was actually doing in a particular passage. Not often, but there have been a couple small examples, but like nothing like this. And I'm like, no, there's no way Christopher could possibly be like so deaf to what is happening 
you know, conceptually and mythologically in this text. I'm like, I, so I'm, I'm looking, I'm just, I just, I, sp- I don't even know how long I spent just staring uh, at this passage because this is the one, I mean, I'd had this sort of sinking feeling with some of the other notes and things that he said before. But now I'm looking at this, you know, this like attempt to reconcile the concept of the elves as children of the of the Valar and the concept of the children of the Valar as it was in the early Silmarillion tradition. And I'm like, that can't be what he means. Right. So it must be me. Right. It must be me. I must. Am I wrong? I'm like, I can't be wrong. (laughs) Not that I can't in general be wrong, but I'm like, I'm surely not wrong about this. Right. I mean, that's that's not that. Anyway, so I was like having an issue. Right. I was having a bit of a crisis. And um, in the end, I finally came on a third reading, which put my mind at ease, right, and kind of restored reality to its its normal orientation. Um, and my third reading is that neither. So so the answer was not both Aslan's compass. It was neither. Uh, neither am I crazy, nor is Christopher Tolkien missing the boat. Um, I think that the actual solution to this riddle is that Christopher is being coy. Um, he's, um, well, I don't want to say having us on. Uh, he's not, like, pulling a prank on us or anything nearly so puerile as that. However, um, uh, when he, uh, uh, when he, he does, of course, get there. Uh, in the end, spoiler alert, Christopher is going to uh, is going to announce that like his reading of the text is that this is like, a, you know, a fundamentally different point of view on the same myths. Like basically the thing that we've been talking about all along um, where the gap comes, like where the problem emerges is not that he didn't tumble to that. Right. It's not that he is oblivious to that. It's that he presents this as if it's, um, I don't know, it, like Christopher kind of holds it back and he gives his notes at first as if like our job as readers is to reconcile this material. Like this is not just, this is not a new angle. This is like a new version, right? And we're supposed to, um, um, we're supposed to we're supposed to sort of figure out how these go. And this we're supposed to take this as like this is Tolkien revising his ideas, right? Like seriously, I'm seriously supposed to be entertaining the idea that he's now being like, yeah, actually, the elves are the kids of the Valar. Turns out, yeah, yeah, that's actually how it works, right? And I'm like, really? No, I'm, I'm not. No, <laughs> that's not what's happening here. I refuse to believe that. But anyway, Christopher's kind of letting us think that, and then he's gonna kind of pull the the rabbit out of the hat later on. And we'll see it in his commentary on the theory of the work stuff next time. We'll see the moment when Chris, so this is, a, is kind of a spoiler, but the, I felt it worth spoiling because again, for me, it made a massive difference. I was super uncomfortable reading Christopher's commentary. Cause I'm like, I, I can't even understand how this is happening, <laughs> but, um, when I see what he was doing, he was kind of leaving that in the air, right? He was kind of like approaching it first as if our job is to reconcile the two of them, right? Observing the differences and, and keep and continually saying things like this very remarkable text, right? And uh, these uh, uh, quite pronounced departures uh, and things like that. Um, and then he comes to the end and he's like, And now I shall unveil my super secret reading of the whole thing. Ta-da! It was from the human perspective all along and they're getting it wrong. And I'm like, yeah, okay, that's kind of what I thought the whole time. And I'm only now seeing that you agree with me. Phew! Okay, that's all fine. Um, But, um, yeah, so uh, um, it's... um, I was as I say, super relieved. Um, so just in case anybody else was having any similar version of that particular crisis, as you were reading through Christopher's notes, I just kind of wanted to share that. Perhaps uh, none of you were so troubled as I was, but uh, I, 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 I definitely had a moment. Uh, and uh, now I feel better. And thank you for sharing that moment with me. Okay. 
let's go back to where we were. So we had gotten, we had, we did last time we discussed version three of the fall of Numenor, uh, which is the old version, right? That's written at the time of the, uh, of the lost road back in 1937. Uh, so about five years earlier, and he's now, um, writing this, the drowning of Anadune at the same time that he's writing the, uh, the notion club papers. No, Aslan's Compass, not on to slide one. This is slide two. This counts as a slide. Uh, anyway, we're good. Um, so uh, we, we got through the, 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 uh, the fall of Numenor, which is like the last version of the Elvish point of view story, right? And then we got the first version of The Drowning of Anadune, and we got about two thirds of the way through that. So we're going to do that. And then we're going to look at some of the things that shifted uh, in his revision uh, of the, the Drowning of Anadune, because I think a lot of those differences, it won't take us too long to look at them, um, but I think that they're, they're, they kind of show some sort of interesting stories. Um, and when I say interesting stories, I mean primarily about, about Tolkien. Um, it is the thing that I just love so much about the history of Middle Earth. I feel like in our study, I have learned so much about how Tolkien thinks and how Tolkien writes. Like it's, it's, it's incredible. Anyway, okay. So uh, I think we ended on this slide, but I wanted to start on it again. For why should the Avalai sit in peace unending there, said they, while we must die and go we know not whither, leaving our own home, for the fault was not ours in the beginning. And is not the evil is not the author of evil, Melico himself, one of the Avalai? And the Avalai, knowing what was said, and seeing the cloud of evil grow, were grieved, and they came less often to Numenor, and those that came spoke earnestly to the Eruhil, and tried to teach them of the fashion and fate of the world, saying that the world was round, and that if they sailed into the utmost west, yet would they but come back again to the east. So and so to the places of their setting out, and the world would seem to them but a prison. Um, so, uh, okay, several things here. So remember, in the first version of the Drowning of Anadune, uh, the human perspective from which the story is written doesn't even understand that there's a difference, right? The Avalai means collectively the elves plus the Valar, right? Everybody who's immortal is in that category. Um, you know, like the, 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 the drowning of Anadune explains the entire thing uh, as us and them, right? Um, yeah. Now, uh, Estel Aragorn, great question. Um, uh, are the names like Melico and Avalai and also Manaway, I would say, same thing? Um, are they, uh, uh, are they a Dunaya sized version, uh, versions of the Elvish? Uh, are just a different stage in the development of his Elvish names. Not a develop. Uh, they are. They are versions uh, of the Elvish. They are meant to be versions of the Elvish. But keep your eye on that as we move into the second version. That's to me one of the very first immediate tip-offs of what's different uh, the second time round. Um, okay. So, uh, so again, the uh, the Avalai are. It, everybody, all the immortal folks, and we humans can't even really tell the difference between them, right? So you can see how on the, like there are times when they seem to be uh, arguing against the Valar, essentially, right? And there are other times when it's clearly the elves that we're discussing. Um, so the boundaries are really unclear. Um, thinking back, though, for a second to, um, to this question of reconciling the drowning of Anadune or comparing and contrasting, right? The drowning of Anadune with uh, the fall of Numenor, that is the old Elvish perspective one and the new human point of view one. Um, there are differences, obviously, mad, major differences between the two of them. And so one of the really interesting questions for us to try to figure out is when we see differences, to what do we attribute those differences? How many of those differences are merely differences of perspective? That is to say, frankly, due to the ignorance of men, right? Especially the men of the later days who are the ultimate transmitters of these, uh, uh, of these stories. Um, so again, like I, me, I totally put the whole like the elves are the like the elves and the valor are all one people. Right. I don't think he's actually saying, actually, I think I'm just going to merge the Valar and the elves into one hemor you know, homogeneous group. I don't think that's how Tolkien's mythology is developing at this particular moment. Right. But there are other moments where 
there are changes, right, from the fall of Numenor to the drowning of Anadune, where it does seem that Tolkien's mythology is, in fact, changing, right? Um, so trying to distinguish between those two things, right, um, is complicated on the one hand, um, uh, but really, um, really challenging, actually. Uh, and um, so for me, this, this is the reason I wanted to start on this slide again, though we ended with it last time, is that to me, this is one of the clearest illustrations of that, right? In the first half of the slide, we can see the confusion which seems to be endemic here, right? That is, to clumsily use a word for it, the theological confusion, right? They don't understand, um, like, they don't have our, I mean, I guess actually we're going to say theology, thinking in medieval terms, it would be more like angelology than it would be like theology. But anyway, um, I get, they don't know enough about who the Valar are to know the distinction between the, the between the Valar and the elves. Um, that So that seems to be part of the confusion of the point of view of this story. But, and tried to teach them of the fashion and fate of the world, saying that the world was round, and that if they sailed into the utmost west, yet would they but come back again to the east, and so to the places of their setting out, and the world would seem to them but a prison? That... I think is not a question of human confusion. That seems to me to be the biggest way, I would say, the most significant element of Tolkien's mythology, which he seems to be genuinely questioning in the writing of The Drowning of Anadune, the one way in which the mythology is actually changing. And that is... Is the world, does the world begin flat and is made round at the time of the destruction of Numenor? That is part of the story, right? That enters in in the fall of Numenor. Um, and remember, the fall of Numenor is the stuff that's like the sequel material, right? To, uh, uh, to the stories of the First Age, which end with the War of Wrath elsewhere. Um, so that... Is, some, is something that he's contemplating. So notice here, I think anyway, that that's something that he's really contemplating changing. Because notice that this makes part of the rationale that the Avalai, presumably elves, uh, make to the Numenorians, right? Who are having their unrest, right? Um, they say to them, the reason for the ban... The reason for the ban is essentially lest you discover that the world is round. If we didn't have the ban, you could keep sailing west. And if you kept sailing west, then you would come back around again from the east. And the world would seem but a prison. Once you've circumnavigated the globe, it's all over, man. Right? I mean, the mystery is gone. Your lives will be impoverished if you discover empirically that the world is round. So we're trying to prevent that. It's all for your own good, right? Now, the ban is always theoretically for their own good, right? Um, but to me, not only the fact that not only is he considering having the world be round from the beginning, um, but that he is... Um, using like integrating that into the whole rationale into the 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 sort of divide between um the Numenorians and the elves is really important i think here's the reason why i think that that element is not is different cuz to me it <laughs> That again, like which ones are due to the confusion and ignorance of the source, and which ones are due to Tolkien's changing concept of his mythology? How do we know? The reason I feel quite confident that 
the making of the world round sooner or originally, right? I mean, according to this version, it's always been round. Um, the reason I tend to think that that's Tolkien actually changing his mind rather than just bringing in a different point of view is that it goes in the opposite direction, right? Um, when you compare this myth to the Elvish myths, if the world in question is our world, then it's this myth that's getting it right and the old myths that's getting it wrong. If the old myths happened in a round world and then in the drowning of Anadune, we had like the legend that the earth used to be flat, but now it's round, right? Then that would kind of seem to fit with like, oh yes, these like naive human uh these naive human stories, you know, confused, misunderstood stories in which they thought, you know, the earth was flat. But like the elves who are like personal friends with those who shaped the world would know what shape the world actually is. Right. So clearly um, the if one of these two myths is based on ignorance of reality, it's the flat world one. Right. So for the naive and ignorant human myth to have the accurate story more accurate than the other one just it just doesn't make sense it breaks the frame of the entire um uh of the entire um like concept of the the more like unsophisticated myth right um so um yeah, yeah. Now, Marilyn is asking, is there any chance that the Avalaii are lying to men? I don't think so, mostly because this still seems to be true in Volume 2 uh, when the, the situation changes somewhat. That is, they no longer give it here. Because um, I agree with you, Marilyn. We, I mean, it's, it's a little bit sensible to be kind of resistant here to this art. Because, I mean... They're trying to win an argument, right? This could be a rhetorical gesture on their part of some kind, right? Um, but uh, we get it, I think, from the narrator in the second version. We don't get it, you know, in the debate here, um, just kind of reported in dialogue. Um, yeah. It is possible, Brian, that the men of later days are misremembering what the elves told their forebears and attributing to the elves' knowledge of what was going to happen. You know, like, basically... They're telling it from the point of view of a world which they know to be round, and so they project the roundness of the world back on the myth, uh, whereas the elves would know the truth that it used to be flat and then was made round. It is, that is possible. That is possible, but... Um, yeah. I don't say that that's an impossible reading. I just don't believe it. Um, I think that Tolkien is really questioning it here. Um, I think that what we're seeing here is Tolkien kind of experimenting with that actual shift uh, in uh, in his mythology. Um, and yeah, Yana, exactly as you're referring to, we're going to come back to this. I don't want to get too caught up in discussing the round world and the question of like, is that change in the mythology? Like what, you know, what is, what are the implications of that change in the mythology um, or that, you know, suggested or proposed or possible change of the mythology? Because that's going to come up much more forcibly in Morgoth's Ring. When we get there early part of next year, um, we will talk about this in much more detail uh, as uh, uh, Tolkien talks about that. That's why, by the way, um, you know, my title for tonight's show is Myths Reconsidered? Question mark. Myths Reconsidered is what we're going to get. It's what Christopher's title for one of the sections of Morgoth's Ring. Um, so, you know, I'm... Uh, 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 kind of playing on that and saying, are we, uh, um, are we seeing that the beginnings of that happening here? Uh, a full discussion of that to come later, but um, uh, but I think it's interesting. Then, of course, he kind of doubled down, doubles down on it um, with Sauron, for with subtle arguments Sauron gainsaid all that the Avalai had taught. And he bade them think, that is the Numenorians, of course, not the Avalai, and he bade them think that the world was not a closed circle, and that therein there were many lands yet for, the, for their winning, and wherein was, wel wherein was wealth uncounted. And even yet, when they came to the end thereof, there was the dark without, out of which came all things. 
and dark is the realm of the Lord of all, Melico the Great, who made this world out of the primeval darkness, and only darkness is truly holy, said he. So, so, um, the flat world concept is now a lie of Sauron, right? Um, this is a uh, remark. So no, this is, these are Numenorians. These are Numenorians that he's talking to here. Yep, Tomas, that's what's happening. Um, so there's a lot that I love about this passage. Um, notice the grounds of Sauron's claim that the world is flat. Why does Sauron support a flat earth cosmology? He supports a flat earth cosmology because, so like, think about these last two passages. The first one, the Avaloi say, if you discover that the world is round, we're like, basically, we're worried that your discontent is going to grow, right? You're, you're going to feel like the world is a prison for you. And now Sauron is saying, no, the world isn't round. That's a dirty lie, right? The world is flat. And it extends out, and there's it is, there is so much more for you to discover, right? Many lands yet for your winning, wherein is wealth uncounted, right? So no, the world isn't a small and narrow place, right? It's not a little prison globe, right? It is vast. It is flat, but it is vast, right? And you've only seen a small portion of it. And of course, the Avaloi are trying to keep you away from the really rich bits. Right. Exactly. Estelle, uh, not just to discover, but to conquer. Right. And then. But wait a second. Hang on. A flat earth still has an edge. Right. So does it just boil down to him saying, well, uh, it's bigger. Right. Um, I mean, couldn't he argue? Couldn't he make the same argument just by saying, no, the Avaloi are mistaken about the radius of the globe. The radius of the globe is significantly larger, so its circumference is quite large. So far from being a small prison cell, it is a very large and quite vast expanse in which there are many lands yet for your winning wherein whose wealth uncounted, right? I mean, if it's just the size, the amount of space, he could have, he didn't have to have a flat world for that. But Sauron wants a flat world because he wants them thinking about the edge of the world, right? What's past the edge of the world? Darkness. The primeval darkness. When you come to the end of the world, there was the dark without, out of which came all things. The end of the world is not the end of the world. The end of the world is the beginning, right? Because it is where all of our... In fact, what you will discover when you get to the edge of the world, when you get to the dark, is that... This entire vast, vast world which you guys can conquer is just like a byproduct of where the real power is, which is the dark. And dark is the realm of the Lord of all, Melico the Great. So he uses the flat earth ideologically to show that Melkor has the world surrounded, right? That the world is generated from the dark and is embraced by the dark, right? Um, it is just this, um, you know, this this sort of plane, this 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 pan held by the darkness, right? Into which the darkness feeds things, um, but the darkness is really the source of all. Yeah, Devor, it reminds me of Gollum's darkness riddle too. Absolutely. Um, yeah, yeah. Um, <laughs> Yana says this, this prison planet idea sounds like every flat earther ever. Tolkien was ahead of his time. Yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah. Um, anyway, so I, I love the way that we can see Tolkien thinking about 
the ideological significance of the flat versus the round world, right? And of course, the reality of the round world, right? It's Sauron is wrong. Sauron is lying here, right? This is not what it's like. This is not how it works. The world is in fact round. And from a human point of view, the world is in fact small. Because of course, at the end of the day, it's not about geography, right? It's about time. It's about their lives. They, it doesn't matter how big the world is in a sense, right? You're only going to live for a few decades, a couple centuries at the late, you know, a few centuries at the most, if you're, you know, of the Royal house of Numenor, um, and then you're gone, right? So, you know, there's only so much you can do. In fact, the, the reality of the situation is that a small life, you know, a small bit of experience, uh, a, a, a what seems like a meager portion has been given to humanity and their challenge is to be content with that. And of course, Sauron, you can see in his temptation is deliberately arguing against contentment, right? First vast, uh, flat land yet to be discovered. Second, the darkness beyond that, right? Not just, so it's not just moving past, it's moving up, right? Hierarchically moving up. Once you've conquered all the space that there is, then you can get to where the space came from, right? Then you can encounter the reality behind reality, right? Um, uh, the, the darkness. Um, so, um, yeah, now, Kit... There, I completely agree with you. If finding out the world is round will make them discontented, why tell them? I agree, Kit. I find, in retrospect, after this passage, I find the elves' argument, or the Avaloi's argument, excuse me, um, really unsatisfactory, right? Because on the one hand, it's like, okay, I, I guess I can understand. I mean, they were right to think that if the, I mean, I'm, I'm sure they were right that if the Numenorians had circumnavigated the globe, they would have been discontented by that. But why point it out, right? If you're going to do the ban, then, like, it just, it seems strange, right? It seems strange. Like, we're trying to keep you in ignorance, because if you knew your real situation, you would be upset. <laughs> it seems to be kind of what it boils down, what the ban boils down to. And it's like, um, I, that's not really good thinking there. Um... And, um, uh, and again, like why, why even, why even say it? Why, why talk about it? Um, so yeah, I'm not a big, um, uh, I'm, I'm, I'm not a big, uh, um, big fan of the, uh, of the elves argu or the Avaloi argument there. Um, yeah, Brian says the uh, the Avaloi don't seem to understand the human perspective. Uh, it's not really a very convincing argument. No, it's not a very convincing argument. Um, yeah, um, Tarlonio, yes, they could sail east and theoretically get around the earth from that side, which is not lost on them, as we'll see. Um, okay. So they do break the ban and they sail off into the west and uh, and we get the attack of Tarkalion on the Blessed Realm. And none can tell the tale of their fate, for none ever returned. And whether they came ever in truth to that haven which of old men thought they could descry, or whether they found it not and came to some other land and there assailed the Avalai, who shall say? For none know. For the world was changed in that time, and the memory of all that went before is dim and unsure. I love this, right? So that business about, like, and the hills fell on them, and they were, like, held in the caves of, you know, all that stuff, and, and uh, the setting fire to Tyrion and, and all that stuff, all right? It's not part of the story, right? How would we know? None of them ever came back to tell the story. So if you're just telling, if the... Uh, if this story is being transmitted through the through the uh, the survivors of Numenor, right? They have literally no idea. The Armada sails off into the west is never seen again until like the bottom falls out of the ocean, right? That's that's the next thing they know happens. Um, uh, so I I love that. Again, it's just one of these things which makes it super clear that this is 
not a changed version of the story. It's not like we're getting rid of all that stuff from the fall of Numenor. It's just from the human point of view. We don't know. Um, but those that are wisest in discernment aver that the fleets of the Numenorians came indeed to Avalonde and encompassed it about, but that the Avalii made no sign. But Manaway, being grieved, sought the counsel at the last of Eru, and the Avalii laid down their governance of earth, and Eru overthrew its shape, and a great chasm was opened in the sea between Numenor and Avalonde, and the seas poured, poured in, and into that abyss fell all the fleets of the Numenorians, and were swallowed in oblivion. But Avalonde and Numenore that stood on either side of the great rent were also destroyed, and they foundered and are no more. Let me read that sentence again, because when I read that sentence, I had to go back and read it again to make sure I had actually heard that properly. But Avalonde and Numenore that stood on either side of the great rent were also destroyed, and they foundered and are no more. And the Avalai therefore had no local habitation on earth, nor is there any place more where memory of an earth without evil is preserved, and the Avalai dwell in secret or have faded to shadows, and their power is minished. Hooey! Um, so, Dora, I have to, so, he says the world was changed, and, that, and Devor is asking, what does that even mean, um, if we're not talking about the world becoming round anymore? Uh, answer, I don't know exactly, but I think what it means is what it's going on to describe in the second part of this paragraph. Um, how is the world changed? Well, like, there are some, you know significant but compared to the making of the world round minor uh changes that is to say like you know coastlines are going to change and land like there's like the you know uh like job security for the cartographers for some time right so uh, there are a lot of changes uh in the world um like there were with the war of wrath right when like Beleriand sank beneath the ocean so um it's kind of that level of change on the one hand but again there's more than that there's also a metaphysical change to the world not transformed from flat to round but uh but change um notice in this paragraph yeah marilyn i i I don't know if the elves are destroyed. Like, I don't, like, you know, um, you know, how many elves were harmed in the making of this cataclysm? I don't know. Um, it doesn't seem to me to necessarily imply that a bunch of the, Aval uh, of the uh, Avalai are wiped out here. But their land is wiped out. Avalonde, the land of the Avalai, is destroyed. It falls into the abyss with Numenor. Both of them do. And that's, Devora, where he comes to emphasize the change in the world, metaphysically speaking. And the Avalai thereafter had no local habitation on earth. So again, it doesn't, doesn't say, and the Avalai were a whole lot fewer because most of them drowned, right? It doesn't suggest that. He just, the, the problem is not that they've died. The problem is that they um, are homeless now because their home has vanished beneath the waves. Remember, they visited Numenor by like transforming themselves into birds and, and all kinds of things, right? So they have powers. They have powers. Um, because remember, are they the elves or are they the Valar? They're both, right? So anyway, okay. And the Avalai thereafter had no local habitation on earth, nor is there any place where, where memory, any place more, where memory of an earth without evil is preserved. And the Avalai dwell in secret or have faded to shadows and their power is minished. So this gets connected with two things. One, the diminishment of the elves. The fading of the firstborn. The fading of the Avalai. Why do we not see them anymore? Why are they not a big factor anymore, as far as we can tell, right? Because their power is minished. Notice something here. Uh, Manaway being grieved, 
this is speculation, of course, by those who are uh, wisest in discernment. Um, Manaway, being grieved, sought the counsel at last of Eru, and the Avalai laid down their governance of the earth and never took it back up again. Right? They've, they're done. The Avalai are done. The Valar slash elves, Valar plus elves, right? They give up their rule and they go into retirement and their power is minished and they dwell in secret or have faded to shadows and nor is there any place more where memory of an earth without evil is preserved. That would be a shift indeed, right? Um... So, yeah, yeah. Um, yes, Brian says, from the perspective of men, it really doesn't matter whether Avalonde was physically destroyed or not. Men no longer have any real access to the Avaloi. Yes, but Brian, this is a major shift because uh, the, the major difference, right, is that the straight road. That elven home that Valinor is not just taken away from the earth and made almost but not quite inaccessible to men, right, is different because it's still there. It's still in Arda. Men are just shut out of it, mostly, right, almost entirely, but not quite entirely. Um, sometimes people whose name means they are Rendell can make it across still, right, or at least see it. Um, so... So, yeah. OK, so they don't. Um, uh, it's still there. They're still act. The, it's the West is still there. The blessed folk are still there. Elves and Valar are still there, still doing their thing. Um, humans just the mortal world is cut off from it. But there is still an umbilical cord that connects it. The straight road, right? The straight path that connects it to uh, uh, to our world. In this version. No. It's gone. Gone. And the Avalai themselves fade. Fade and go away. Um, and retire for good from the act of... So, conceptually, metaphysically, I think there's a massive difference between this and that other concept there. Um, now, absolutely, Brian. Absolutely, this could be the ignorance of men. No, that, I, remember, that's my premise from the beginning. That's my premise, which, when Christopher seemed to be not going along with that premise, was making me feel like I was going crazy. Absolutely. I'm not saying that's what's actually happening. I'm just saying that's the mannish version of that that we're getting in this, in this story, which makes this story quite remarkable, right? Um, and what this is like to me... Remember how earlier in The Drowning of Anadune, um, when the... The narrator openly questioned the War of Wrath, right? The you know then the Avaloi came over and they worked with the Eruhin and like the they got together and they overthrew Melkor, which seemed cool, but he just kind of ran off. Um, clearly, his power was not broken, right? So they they're having no truck with the concept that Melkor was chained up and cast out. Pfft, obviously, Melkor wasn't cast out. Look. I mean, again, c come live over here in uh, in in Middle Earth for a few millennia, and you'll see, right? Uh, you, you live over here where a lot of men is unhappy, and then tell me again how Melkor's been like locked away, right? Baloney, I don't believe that. Um, so this sounds to me like that. After the fall downfall of Numenor, what happens? The Avaloi used to fly over and visit and stuff like that. Anybody see any Avaloi fly over to visit lately? Right? How about the Valar? They still making themselves a nuisance or, or like interceding, interceding in any way? Right? See that at all? Nope. Me neither. Okay. So this is the conclusion, right? This is the myth that they tell that in the fall of Numenor, Avalonde itself was destroyed. Um, those that are wisest in discernment have a sense, right? Which is almost right, right? It's almost right. It's almost right that, because I, I mean, they lay down their governance of the earth. That's true. Um, is it true? 
that it's never taken up again, that they're permanently demoted, their power is diminished, and they dwell in secret or have faded to shadows, like Manway, Mandos, all of them? Don't think so, right? That bit they don't have. But where would they get it? Where would they get it? Zach is asking, a couple people were asking this same kind of question. How much are we supposed to be imagining this is going to be our world? Is this our world or is this not our world? Um, so we're going to talk about that a lot. Um, all I can say is going on what we have in the Silmarillion tradition, this is totally our world, right? Tolkien's entire mythological concept begins with our world. Tolkien's whole impulse is to explain phenomena in our world. Whether we're talking about phenomena such as Ireland, or whether we're talking about phenomena such as um, uh, the English fairy tradition, right? Um, which has no native mythology. Um, that's those things he is trying to explain. He is trying to provide. Um, therefore, I think presumptively we have to think this is our world. Sort of. But do we have to? Do we really have to? Can we not? Could we? Wouldn't it be kind of Fun, more fun if we didn't? These are questions I'll be asking later on. Uh, we're, 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 we'll talk about this when we get to Morgoth's Ring. Um, yeah. Um, yeah, Stephen says, would there be a need for the world to be round if it weren't our world? Yeah, exactly, Stephen. Um, I think that we do see exactly... The, ins the, the insistence, and I think I have to say increased insistence on the rondeur of the world, right, um, so tells me that we're still there, where we were in the Book of Lost Tales, right? That Tolkien has not imaginatively separated his, the world of his mythology from our world. Um, that's not to say that it's our world in a kind of a simple sense, um, like he believes this to be the actual word by, you know, honest to God history of our world, right? Exactly. Um, I mean, these are myths, not history precisely, but still, conceptually, yeah, yeah, it's still tied to our world. Um, all right, let's keep going. We're almost to the end of the first version there. Here's the attitude of the exiles. And though they knew that Numenor and Avalonde were no more, they said, Avalonde is no more, and Numenor is not, yet they were, and not in this present darkness, yet they were, and therefore still are, in true being, and in the whole shape of the world. And the Numenorians held that men so blessed might look upon other times than those of their body's life, and they longed ever to escape from the darkness of exile and see in some fashion the light that was of old. But all the ways are now crooked, they say, that once were straight. All the ways are now crooked that once were straight. Remember how that differs from that repeated, repeated phrase that Laudum kept coming across, right? Um, that there is a straight path, right? Um... There's no sense of a straight path, but you can, but it's okay because you can still time travel like Raymer, right? That's what the Numenorians were doing. That's what their visions, exactly, Devorah, that's what their visions from Middle Earth were. Not just visions of what was happening across the sea or what was down the straight path, but time traveling. Time traveling. That's 
So, and thus he links directly the end of the drowning of Anna Dune with the Notion Club papers, right? Um, which seems to have inspired them. Okay. Uh, okay, no, a little bit more about the uh, exiles. And in this way it came to pass that any were spared from the downfall of Numenore, and maybe that was the answer to the errand of Amardil. For those that were spared were all of his house and kin, for Elendil had remained behind, refusing the king's summons when he set out to war, and he went aboard ship and abode there, riding out the storm in the shelter of the eastern shore, and being protected by the land from the great draught of the sea that drew all down into the abyss, he escaped from death at the, in that time. And a mighty wind arose, such as had not been before, and it came out of the west, and it blew the sea into great hills, and fleeing before it, Alendo and his sons in seven ships were carried far away, borne up on the crests of great waves like mountains of Middle-earth, and they were cast at length up far inland in Middle-earth. The story of Amardil, um, Amandil as he'll be later on, is... Uh, that is in the Akalabeth. That's new here, right? This concept of uh, the dude who broke the ban, right? The, um, the holy man who broke the ban uh, in order to, uh, with the goal of intervening for his people one more time, like, a, like Arendel of old. Um, I am tempted to say no. I'm not just tempted. I will say, of course... He thinks of Amardil now. Why does he invent the character of Amardil now? Of course he invents the character of Amardil now. Why does Elendil need a dad? Why does he need a dad who's going to be a second Eärendil and sail off into the west? Because that's the Notion Club papers pattern, right? And the Lost Road pattern. The father and son pairings, right? From the Lost Road concept through to the more mature Notion Club Papers concept, it was always going to be in those pairings, right? We kept seeing those father-son pairings. And we can see it's still active in the Notion Club Papers, just as Ari Laudum, right, has his dad who sailed off in his ship, the Arendel, right, um, and went off into the West and was never seen again. Right? Get exactly, Zach. And the father is always lost. Right? That story repeating itself generation by generation, whether in through reincarnated pairs of fathers and sons in the Lost Road or not through reincarnation, but through generational, uh, uh, through like the time travel back through uh, ancestors that was going to happen in the Notion Club papers. We see the same pattern. So that father son story which was initiated in the Lost Road and then gets developed in the Notion Club papers, is now getting worked backwards into the story themselves. Because although neither one of them ever got there, right? Neither the Lost Road nor the Notion Club papers as narratives ever get to the final point, which was like the final point in time travel, which is Numenor and the fall of Numenor. Neither of them ever got there, but both of them saw it coming. Um, and so Elendil's dad... And of course, Elendil is just one of those uh, um, um, we can see already in their names, the same name pattern, right? Um, what were the father-son names? What do they always translate to? The, the, the pairs of names, the father-son names? Do you remember? What do they translate to? Yep, one elf friend. That's what Elendil translates to. Elfriend and, and the other one? The other one was basically like friend of the Valar. Like right? the friend of the elves and the friend of the Valar. Yeah, god friend and elf friend. Exactly. Exactly. Um, uh, uh, god wina and elf wina uh, would be the Anglo Saxon versions, right? Or one version of the Anglo Saxon versions. Yeah, god friend and elf friend. Um, so Amardil is the god friend and Elendil is the elf friend, right? So um, so we never get the full story, right? We never get the story of, uh, um, you know, he doesn't get anywhere near 
the actual end of the Notion Club papers or of the Lost Road. But I know how they were going to end, I think, right? They were going to end like this. Um, the story of Amardil here and Elendil and the way that their two fates are bound up in the end of Numenor. Amardil's desperate journey, breaking the band by himself with just a couple people and, you know, with two or three other mariners in the boat and Elendil. Right. Who is spared and sent off into the east. You know, that's this is this is where the story was going. Um, so he never writes that end of the story as an end of that story. But he integrates it. Right. He integrates it into the drowning of Anadune and ultimately into the Akalabeth. And then, of course, we get the great waves like mountains bearing them far inland in Middle Earth, like we saw several times before. Notice, though. A major change has been introduced here. That thing that I was marveling at so frequently when we were talking about the Notion Club papers is greatly reduced here. That sense of exile, that sense of banishment, right? That those who survive from Numenor and are carried on the wicked waves to Middle-earth um, are not just... Um, are not just refugees. They're exiles, specifically. They have been banished. They're like Adam and Eve kicked out of the garden, right? Um, and that's lessened here. Here it is, and it's Amondil who makes the difference, sorry, Amardil who makes the difference here, right? Um, it is possibly in response to his plea that his son Elendil and their people are preserved, are saved, this is more of a deliverance now. And that's not to say that that sense of the exile stuff isn't still relevant. Right. Um, and I think it does help to, under to help us to understand how they talk and the kinds of traditions that come from them. Right. It's clear that, uh, that Elendil still feels like an exile when he gets to Middle Earth. But in the narrative itself, it, that is much less unequivocal. Or rather, it's much more equivocal, right? Um, and we can we see more of that element of deliverance, which I had confessed before. I had always seen as the primary element uh, of their story. Okay. All right. Second version through. I'm going to try to be a little quicker on the second version through uh, because there are only a few. It's quite similar, but there are some interesting touches. So, uh, Estelle Aragorn, here we're getting around to what you were talking about before. Before the coming of men, there were many powers that governed the earth, and these were the Erubaini, servants of God. Many were their ranks and their offices, but some there were among them that were mighty lords, the Avaloi, whom men remembered as gods, and at the beginning the greatest of these was the Lord Arun. But it is said that long ago, even in the making of the earth, the Lord Arun turned to evil and became a rebel against Eru, desiring the whole world for his own and to have none above him. Therefore his brother Amon endeavored to rule the earth and the powers according to the will of Eru, and Amon dwelt in the west. But Aaron remained on earth, dwelling and hiding in the north, and he worked evil, and he had the greater power. And the earth was darkened in that time, so that to Aaron a new name was given, and he was called Mulcher, the Lord of Darkness. And there was war between Mulcher and the Avaloi. What's the number one difference between this version and the old version? Yes, it's all about the names, right? The old versions of the names, Estelle Aragorn, as you were saying before, right? Um, there's, um, there's, they were they were still clearly adaptations of the Elvish names, right? Melakor and Manaway. So it seemed to be adapted to like the pronunciation rhythm of Adonaiic, right? Um, but uh, not really translated. Just kind of messed up a little bit. Like they didn't quite get the names right. They heard the correct names, but they didn't quite get them right. Um, now. They have completely different names, Arun and Aman and Mulher. Why do you think?
Why did he make that change? What led Tolkien, you think, perhaps, to make that change? My suspicion? Because he developed the language in the meantime, right? Adunayak was only just starting to come through before. Um, remember how we were looking at the moment when, like, we're noticing how cool it was that the Adunayak language, as in the narrative, Laudam began to explain how the Adunayak language was coming through to him. Christopher reveals that, like, at that same time, like, in the process of describing that, the Adunayak language began to come through to Tolkien, and he developed the Adunayak language as he was, like, coming up with the things that were coming through uh, to Laudum. So when he began um, Tolkien, when Tolkien began the Notion Club papers, even part two of the Notion Club papers, he didn't really have Adunayak uh, clearly worked out. He did work it out much more clearly as he went forward. And that seems to be the first thing that we can see here in this second version. This is now post Adunayak, right? After that language has come through. And that seems to me to inform everything from the very beginning. Indeed, I would be surprised if that weren't the impetus for rewriting the thing at all, right? Um, that wouldn't surprise me in the least bit. Let me say it that way. It wouldn't surprise me in the least bit if the his impulse to write a second version uh, at, at all um, was that he had developed the language more. And it, he didn't just want to go back and cross out some names and replace it with other things in the margin, right? Because having developed the language or having discovered the language, um, he now knows better how they think. Right. Because he's learned from the language more about what this culture is like. So there are some things that he goes back and he changes. So I think that the names here are much more than just replacements. You know, our own uh, for uh, uh, Milico. Right. Um, and instead, we're seeing the same story retold after Tolkien had developed the, the, the developed the culture more in his mind, primarily because he had developed the language. That's just my theory. I don't know for a fact, but that's my theory. Therefore, the hearts of the Erochin were turned westward, where was the land of Amman, as they believed, and an abiding peace. And it is said that of old there was a fair folk dwelling yet in Middle-earth, and men knew not whence they came. But some said that they were the children of the Avaloi that did not die, for their home was in the blessed realm far away, whither they still might go, and whence they came, working the will of Amon in all the lesser deeds and labors of the world. The, Elid the Elidai they were named in their own tongue of old, but by the Erohin they were called Nimri, the Shining Ones, for they were exceeding fair to look upon, and fair were all the works of their tongues and hands. And the Nimri became sorrowful in the darkness of the days, and withdrew ever westward, and never again was grass so green, nor flower so fair, no, nor water so filled with light when they had gone. And the Eruhin for the most part followed them, though some there were that remained in the great lands, free men, serving no evil lord, and they were shepherds, and dwelt far from the towers and cities of the kings. Okay, so... We got the beginning now. So what is the what what are some of the cultural shifts that we're getting? Well, remember, when the Adunayak language came through, what came through with it? When Laudam was describing that. Remember when Laudam was describing the languages coming through and he got all these bunches of words and he put them into different lists, right? There was the Anglo-Saxon words, which got into their own special list of Anglo-Saxon words they already knew. And then he put the other, the other into three lists, the A list, the B list, and the C list. And the A list was Quenya and the B list was Adonaiic and the C list was other things, right? Um, and, um, okay, so that's how it came through to Laudum, and remember what Laudum did with that, right? As Laudum started to get these languages, he began to figure out what was the culture of Numenor like 
because and he's like so they clearly they speak Quenya and they speak Adunaic, right? And they um, or you know they speak Avalonian and they speak Numenorian, um, and uh, but because it's they're clearly two different like two words in like in this in those two languages for the same things at the same places, right? Things will have two names, one in one in Quenya and one in Adonaic. And from that he begins to draw conclusions about what the culture of Numenor is like. Right. So having had that imaginative process through Loudham, and again I suspect in in some ways through his own language invention process as well, um notice the first big change that emerges in the drowning of Anadunai as a consequence. Right. And the first the and that change is we're not going to confuse the elves and the Valar. That that wouldn't have happened because the Numenorians would know full well. The Numenorians knew the elves, had close relationships with the elves, and so might not know everything about Valinor and how it ticks, but they would certainly be able to tell the difference between a, a Vala and an elf, right? So, but how do we know that? How do we know about that cultural shift? How can we be so sure that they would not just lump elves and Valar all into one big category of immortal people? Because of the languages, right? Because of Quenya and Adonaiic side by side, right? Which notice, was already there in the first version. What was the name of the king? Tarkalion, right? A Quenya word, a Quenya name, right? Uh, uh, Manaway, Meliko, they clearly knew Quenya names, right? Um, which they kind of did in their own their own versions of, right? But but they clearly had heard the Quenya names and remembered, a, uh, uh, re- remembered something like it, right? So even in the old one, we can see they have familiarity with Quenya. And once he clarifies that even more, he realizes, yeah, no, no, that's that's that that won't work. That won't work at all. They know who the Elodai are and the difference between the Elodai and the Avaloi. Um, and so we get that distinction made. And as I say, I really think that that is an offspring of this linguistic development that is the primary um uh, in my theory, motive force uh, of this second version. And it was at the time of evening that Azrabel set forth. Azrabel, of course, is Eärendil, um, but nobody is given Quenya names in this version of the story, right? It's all Adunayak all the time in this version. Once again, solidifying that this is obviously and totally a human point of view story, right? Uh, making no compromise with the elvish versions of the story, not even using their names. And it was at the time of evening that Azrabel set forth, and he sailed into the setting sun and passed out of the sight of men. But the winds bore him over the waves, and the Nimri guided him, and he went through the, sun, through the seas of sunlight and through the seas of shadow, and he came at last to the blessed realm and the land of Amman, and spoke unto the Avaloi. But Amon said that Eru had forbidden the Avaloi to make war again by force upon the kingdoms of Mulher, for the earth was now in the hands of men to make or to mar. Yet it was permitted to him, because of their fidelity and the repentance of their fathers, to give to the Eruhin a land to dwell in if they would. And that land was a mighty island in the midst of the sea, upon which no foot had yet been set. But Amon would not permit Azrabel to return again among men, since he had walked in the blessed realm where yet no death had come. Therefore he took the ship Rothenzil and filled it with a silver flame and raised it above the world to sail in the sky, a marvel to behold. Notice, um... Yeah, oh, Marilyn says, why has the place and the ruler the same name? Um, they don't. Yet. Um... Christopher suggests in his notes that the name Amon for Valinor derives from this, that Amon was first the Adunaic name of, of Manwe and then becomes the name of the country. Um, when he says the land of Amon, he's not referring to the name of the country. He's like the land of Amon, like, you know, the land where Amon rules, Manwe, the land of Manwe, you know, where he's king. Um, so, yeah, no, it's not the name of the land. It's just the name of the dude which is going to become the name of the land, 
But anyway, um, great question. I was confused by that too. Um, okay. I think I skipped over this bit or I, I, I definitely don't feel like I did justice to this when we got to this part of the first version of the story. Like, I think I totally skimmed over the totally mind blowing thing about the A. Arendel, excuse me, the Azra Bell story uh, in The Drowning of Anna Dune. What is it? The mind blowing thing? I mean, everybody loves them some A. Arendel, right? In the elf version, he's the big hero, the turning point, the prophesied one uh, uh, who fulfills the prophecy to, uh, uh, of, 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 of Huor, right? Uh, and everything else. And uh, and and in the drowning of Anadu, Dune, we love Arendel, right? He's the big, pivotal, enormous hero. What's um? What's the difference? What's the mind blowing thing about the Arendel story? What does Arendel do? What's Arendel's quest? What's Arendel's quest? So the two pivotal questions are, what is Arendel's quest, and when does it happen? His quest is to get help. For whom? He speaks to the Valar on behalf of two kindreds. Yeah, but not here, James. Exactly. Exactly. He is speaking on behalf of the elves. What does he have to do with the elves? Right? He's a human hero. He's one of the Eruhin. There's nothing immortal about Arendel. Right? He's a dude. I mean, he's an important dude. He's a big time heroic dude. He's one of the Eruhin. Uh, and he, he, he arises among the Eruhin and he goes off on this journey. When, when, when does this happen? When does this happen? Timing? In the evening. Yeah, at sunset. <laughs> okay, that's the correct answer. At the time of evening is when it happens. We don't know what year it was, but we know the time of day. So there we go. I love that touch, actually. This happens after the War of Wrath. The War of Wrath has already happened. The War of Wrath, or at least that thing that the elves call the War of Wrath, which clearly from the human point is the war of no big deal, or at least the war of no long-term consequences, right? Um, must be great for the elves who all left, but uh, for the humans who are here in Middle-earth, the War of Wrath was was a blink of the eye, right? Um, uh, yeah, so anyway, that's already happened, you know, uh, 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 Mulher has been overthrown right up in the north uh, but he's gone into hiding and he's still doing his thing so it's long after that when one arises among the Erohin who goes off and he talks to Amon and gets his ship benevolently set on fire presumably benevolently, benevolently and raised above the world to sail in the sky a marvel to behold which is a sign to the people that they should go so Numenor is the only result of Arendel's mission. His mission is only on behalf of human beings, and the only result of it is the gift of the island of Numenor. And so the Erochin are enabled to sail away and leave Middle-earth behind and go off into the west and run away like everybody else, and they go to Numenor and they settle down there. Um, uh, and it's all thanks to Arendel, who's still up in the sky and you can see his star. That's why he's the brightest of stars, right? And why we say hail Arendel. Um, no Silmaril. Yeah, whatever. What, what's, what's that even, right? I don't even know. Um, yeah. So, so great question, Yana. So, okay. Is this one of those things that's a distortion of history by the, ignorant myth writer uh, among the humans or, you know, a failure of transmission down the road or is Tolkien rewriting the Arendel story? My answer is the former here. 
unlike the round earth, which seems to me to point to an actual developing change in Tolkien's mind, this does not seem like a change. Um, again, and my reasons for that, the shift in the mythology that the round world suggests to me does not fit cleanly with, uh, again, it can be made to do so, but I, I, it, it doesn't feel right to me. I don't think it fits well with this new conception of the later uh, human myths of greater ignorance and less understanding. Um, this fits it perfectly, right? If the true story is the Elvish version, right? If Arendel really went to him on, uh, uh, on behalf of the two kindreds, James, as you said, I can totally see how the post-Numenorean handed down to humans in Middle-earth version of this story would completely lose sight of the fact that he also was there to plead for elves, right? Um, and that the couple things, right? So in the elvish version of the story, the founding of Numenor, the establishment of Numenor is like a side effect, right? First you get the War of Wrath, and then you get the Deliverance, and the elves are brought over, and also... Oh, there are the faithful men, right? And they're like, yeah, we should throw them a bone too. Let's make them an island, right? So it happens as a consequence of Arendel's, but it's not like that's what Arendel is asking for, right? Um, here, he's almost like Moses, right? I mean, he's almost on a like, let my people go mission here, right? It's not exactly the same. It's not deliverance out of slavery and to the promised land um, because the land hasn't been promised yet right it's it's a it's a catastrophe it's not the fulfillment of a promise um but still um he um uh he explicitly goes to uh, get a remedy for their situation and Numenor is the remedy right so James you're absolutely right um they um would never have gotten the gift if Arendel hadn't sailed if they hadn't asked for it um and that's his whole mission here. So, but again, does this fit to me? The, a later human version of the story, which is really just focused on the human point of view and knows little and cares less about how this whole thing fits into the plot of the Elvi of the story of Elvish history in Middle Earth. Yeah, it totally fits in there, right? Um, uh, to say that basically. You look at the fall of Numenor and you look at, uh, or not even the fall of Numenor, you look at the Book of Lost Tales, right? And you look at, uh, especially the Book of Lost Tales, uh, and you look at the drowning of Anadune and you're like, yeah, okay, obviously Arendel is the most awesome thing ever, right? Because everybody is claiming him, right? Oh, he's an elf, total elf hero, right? Greatest of all the elf heroes. You know, he's like the prophet. I mean, the Book of Lost Tales, he is almost literally like the Messiah of the elves, Arendel is. I mean, there are prophecies of his birth that sound totally messianic, right? I, I wouldn't say needlessly messianic, but but emphatically messianic. And then, and then of course, here now he's the great hero of the humans too. The humans are claiming him uh, as well. Um, so, uh, anyway, yeah. So I I, I think that this. Um, uh, this makes a lot of sense that this would be how they would be distorting the A. Arendel story. But um, anyway, okay, so there's Azrabel. A. Arendel, what do you say? What? Quenya name? No, 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 no. He's got a, he's got a Adonaic name, obviously. And so does his ship, Roth and Zeal. Okay. But the Avaloi, for, so back to the ban where we started tonight. But the Avaloi forbade them to sail so far westward that the coasts of Anadune could no longer be seen, and the, and the Adunai were as yet content, though they did not fully understand the purpose of this ban. But the purpose of Amon, we're told explicitly right away, and notice that it's Amon's perspective and not just vaguely of all of the, uh, of all of the elves plus Valar put together, but the purpose of Amon was that the Eruhin should not be tempted to seek for the Blessed Realm, nor desire to overpass the limits set to their bliss, becoming enamored of the immortality of the Avaloi and the land where all things endure. For as yet Eru permitted the Avaloi to maintain upon earth some isle or shore of the western lands, men know not where, an abiding place, an earthly memorial of that which might have been if Mulher had not bent his ways, nor men followed him. And that land the Adunai named Avaloni. 
Uh, by the way, Adunai is, of course, Numenorians. They don't call themselves Numenorians because that's Quenya. They call themselves Adunai because it's all Adunai all the time. Anyway, and that land, the Adunai named Avaloni, the haven of the gods. For at times, when, the, when all the air was clear and the sun was in the east, they could descry, as there seemed, a city white shining on a distant shore, and great harbors, and a tower. But this only from the topmost peak of their island could the far-sighted see, or from some ship that lay at anchor off their western shores, as far as it was lawful for any mariner to go. For they did not dare to break the ban, and some held that it was a vision of the blessed realm that men saw. But others said that it was only a further isle where the Nimri dwelt, and the little ones, and the little ones that do not die, for mayhap the Avaloi had no viable dwelling upon earth. I actually think it's visible. Sorry, I think that was a uh, typo on my part. I messed that up. Um, no visible dwelling upon earth, no viable dwelling either, possibly. But I think that's not what he said. Um, okay, so the ban is reinstated. It's a, explicitly about mortality now. It's not about... The, and so, um, is the earth flat again? Well, we're not sure from this. It hasn't come up yet, right? Um, but it is not given by the elves. So, the objections that we were having, the shortcomings that we were seeing in that really kind of questionable argument um, by the Avaloi last time about, like, no, oh, we only gave the ban to keep you in ignorance so you wouldn't be unhappy, right? Uh, finding out that the world was round, um, we've cut that. And instead, he just says explicitly, I don't want you, like, you're mortal. You need to be cool with being mortal. We don't want you to come to be tempted to seek for the blessed realm nor desire to overpass the limit set to your bliss. I'm sorry, right? There's a glass ceiling. Deal with it, <laughs> right? You know, that's, and again, I say it that way, I joke about it that way, because doesn't it feel a little bit like that? Right? Notice what's not said there in that paragraph. What's not said in that paragraph is, Eru in his wisdom gave different gifts to the different people, and the gifts that he gave to men are no lesser than the gifts that are given to the... They are different, but they are not lesser than the gifts that are given to the elves. Right? It's not said like that at all. The purpose of Amon was that the Eruhin should not be tempted to seek for the blessed realm nor desire to overpass the limits set to their bliss. Right? So, uh, uh, Keleg up there uh, in the Twitch chat, the reason they don't emphasize the gift of Iluvatar, remember, this is the human point of view. Right? The narrator is, I think, showing his human bias here even showing his, like, Numenorian bias, or, excuse me, his Adunayic bias, right? Because he is characterizing the difference between the elves and the men as you have been given virtually unlimited bliss, and we've been given only a tiny bit of bliss. How is that fair? We only get bliss for, like, a couple centuries, and you get bliss for, like, untold millennia. We're getting gypped over here at Numenor, right? The Numenorian argument is already there, underlying his description. He's not being objective. Uh, to state about the gifts of Iluvatar and everything, you'd have to be seeing it from the outside. You'd have to be objective. And our myth-teller here is not objective. I get the impression our myth-teller is trying to be objective, but I think our myth-teller is failing to be objective. And that's kind of cool. That's kind of fun. Um, okay, let's keep going. Thus it was that the voyages of the Adunai in those days went ever eastward and not west, from the darkness of the north to the heats of the south, and beyond the south to the nether darkness. And the Eruhin came often to the shores of the great lands, and they took pity on the forsaken world of Middle-earth. And the princes of the Adunai set foot again upon the western shores in the dark years of men, and none now dared withstand them, for most of the peoples of that age that sat under the shadow were now grown weak and fearful, and coming among them the sons of the Adunai taught them many things. Language they taught them, for the tongues of men on Middle-earth were fallen into brutishness, and they cried like harsh birds, or snarled like the savage beasts. 
and corn and wine the Adunai brought, and they instructed men in the sowing of seed and the grinding of grain, in the shaping of wood and the hewing of stone, and in the ordering of life, such as it might be in the lands of little bliss. Bias, bias, bias. <laughs> I mean, I'm not saying there's no ob objectivity there, right? The lot of men is unhappy. That's fine. But again, you, you see it creeping in there, right? Then the men of Middle Earth were comforted, and here and there upon the western shores the houseless woods drew back, and men shook off the yoke of the offspring of Mulher, and unlearned their terror of the dark. And they revered the memory of the tall sea kings, and when they had departed, called them gods, hoping for their return. For at that time the Adunai dwelt never long in Middle Earth, nor made any habitation of their own. Eastward they must sail, but ever west their hearts returned. Um, so, those of you who remember the Akalabeth really well will have noticed this passage is almost straight in the Akalabeth. It's kept almost completely in the Akalabeth with one really interesting difference. Anyone remember the difference? Christopher points it out in his commentaries too. Did anybody was anybody struck by the difference? What's what's here in this version that doesn't get kept in the Akalabeth? The language bit. It's the language bit that is not kept in the Akalabeth. Language they taught them, for the tongues of men on Middle-earth were fallen into brutishness, and they cried like harsh birds, or snarled like the savage beasts. This is why Westron is based on Adunayak. This is why the common tongue in Middle-earth is the common tongue. Not because the Numenorians brought their tongue with them from Numenor, and then kind of imperialistically spread it, across Middle-earth, but because they taught their language to people in their benevolent days. Um, Bruce, it is a little bit like how Treebeard says the elves taught the speech to the trees. Uh, a little bit, yeah. Um, but I think it's interesting that that language bit was cut from the Akalabeth, but that's not what I'm interested in right now. That's a question for a different time. Like, what does it suggest that he cut it from the Akalabeth? We're not there yet. Um, but what, it, what, I, what I am thinking about is the fact that it is here. Thinking of the importance, at least what I believe to be the importance of the development of the Adonaic language for this second version of the story, that language uh, and the teaching of language becomes an explicit factor here. Right. It becomes the it is the first and primary um, uh, sort of acculturating state. Right. Or factor. Um, it's better than agriculture. It's better than architecture. It's better than uh, than, uh, uh, you know, all the other things that they teach them. Right. Um, is. Their language. Um, because the tongues of men on Middle Earth were fallen into brutishness, and they cried like harsh birds or snarled like the savage beasts. Um, it is Zachary. You're right. Like how Ro, uh, the Rohirrim described the Dun the Dunlin tongue. Um, no wait. Who is it who says that? It's not in the. In, in the Battle of Helm's Deep, Gamling is the one who says it is an ancient speech of men, right? They speak in the Dunlendish tongue. It is an ancient speech of men, and he translates it. Uh, somebody else says to him first that the sound of the Dunlendings to them is just like the, the harsh crying of beasts. Um I'm trying to remember who says it. I can't remember who it is. Is it Gimli? I think it might be not one of the Rohir, one of the Rohir, the Rohiric soldiers who says that. Somebody will get up for me. Uh, but anyway, okay. Um, yeah, what was I talking about? The language, right? Okay. Um, 
one of the new editions of the story, right? Um, one of the things that we see um, brought in to the legends in this second version, um, which is this is there, there, this is not there at all. This is not there at all in the new um, uh, in the first version of the drowning of Anna Dune. Um, what we see is the way in which they bless Middle Earth, the way that they impact Middle Earth. Remember that. Um, remember that uh, the. Elves, the Nimri, are described as blessing Middle-earth. Remember, like, the light shines and the water is different and everything, and then it all darkens when the Nimri leave, start to leave Middle-earth? Um, that, uh, that same thing is being done here, right, by the Anadune, by the, by the Numenorians. Um, and it's interesting that they're being given that role. And it certainly shows, it emphasizes the fall of the Numenorean. So it's not just a completely pro-Numenorean approach, right? Um, but I think it is a really, um, it, it is Amir who says it's the sound of beasts. Thank you, Yona. I appreciate that. Um, yeah, yeah. Um, yeah, exactly. Um, yeah, well, Brandon, this is before the imperialistic age. I mean, the, the, the narrator is not going to hide the fact that later on uh, the Numenorians are going to come only to dominate and enslave the people of Middle-earth. Um, here they're just teaching and then leaving, right? Um, and when they leave, the, 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 you know, the people of Middle-earth, are their life is improved. Um, uh, they were comforted, right? Um, men shook off the yoke of the offspring of Mulher and unlearned their terror of the dark. This is all positive stuff, right? Um, uh, so again, I, is there bias? Yes, there's bias. But again, I don't think this is not... It, there's bias, but there isn't just Homerism, right? This is not just like, the Numenorians are awesome and they do nothing wrong. Like, we know they do stuff wrong and we're getting there, right? Um, when I talk about bias, I'm talking about bias like seeing the world through the human lens, Right. So the bias, especially that I was pointing to before, was in that discussion, which we're going to get, of course, before long again, a second time, that debate between the elves uh, and the humans. The narrator seems to be seeing things from the human point of view, right? He's not really seeing things objectively and, and, and weighing both the human and the elvish side of that equally. Okay, good, right? It's Amir who says, they are only the screams of birds and the bellowing of beasts to my ears. Good, excellent. Zachary, great uh, great call. That's a really interesting, uh, that's a really interesting thing. And notice what this shows, right? He cut that passage out. He cut that passage out uh, of the drowning of Anadune and he put it in the drawer, right? And then he took it out again. What do you know? Anyway, okay, let's keep going. The doom of the world, they said, one alone can change. So this is this is the debate now, right, between the elves and the Numenorians when uh, in the time of our Pharazon we're starting to become dis unquiet, right? The doom of the world, they said, one alone can change. Who made it? And were you so to voyage that escaping all deceits and snares you came indeed to the blessed realm, little good would it do to you? For it is not the land of Amon that maketh its people deathless, but the dwellers therein do hallow the land, and there you should rather wither the sooner, as moths in a flame too bright and hot. But our Pharazon said, And doth not Azrabel, my father, live? Or is he not in the land of Amon? To which it was answered, Nay, he is not there, though maybe he liveth. But of such things we cannot speak unto you. And behold! The fashion of the earth is such that a girdle may be set about it, or as an apple it hangeth on the branches of heaven, and it is round and fair, and the seas and lands are but the rind of the fruit, which shall abide upon the tree until the ripening that Eru hath appointed. And though you sought forever, yet mayhap you would not find where Ammon dwelleth, but journeying on beyond the towers of Nimroth would pass into the uttermost west. 
so would you come out at so would you but come at last back to the places of your setting out, and then the whole world would seem shrunken, and you would deem that it was a prison. Okay, so he's they, we start with the new ver like the the response about the um the the um limitation of bliss concern, right? The undying realm uh concept, right? Yeah, no, no, no. Um the doom of the world is such that, you know, I mean only Eru can un can change the doom of the world because he set it up, right? So the elves are appealing to that, saying the way the world is made is the way that Eru made it. Right. Um, we can't change the fact that we live in the undying lands. You wouldn't like it there. It wouldn't make you immortal. It's not going to change you. He made us one way, made you another way. We just all have to put up with this. Right. Um, we do see them come around to saying that uh, the world is round again, though. Right. World is still round. Um, that's not argument number one anymore, but it still does come up. Right. That if you went around the world, the whole world would seem shrunken and you would deem that it was a prison. But it makes a big difference that the ban isn't premised on that. Right. The ban of the, the whole point of the ban uh, uh, is not just to, to keep them ignorant of the you know, to, to conceal the fact that the world is round. Right. Um, yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah. So, James, the whole the round world is a prison thing is what the exiles say after the fall in the Akalabeth. Yes. Yes, exactly. Um, so, James, see how it's shifting sort of forward, right? First, it's like the initial premise. Well, they're going to find out the world is a prison, so let's try to hold this knowledge away from them as long as possible and make a ban, right? Then that has nothing. Now it's it's shifted back a little bit, right? It comes up, um, but only as a kind of FYI, right? When they're talking about, since we're talking about the doom of the world, let's also talk about the fashion of the world, right? Right. Um, and then James, yes, later on in the Akalabeth, it's only going to come up after the destruction of Numenor. Yeah. Yeah. Now, here you go. Was it Devra? Was it, uh, Devorah, sorry. Was it you who was, uh, talking about sailing around the world the other way? And on a time, Arpharazon sat with his counselors in his high house, and he debated the words of the messenger, saying that the shape of the earth was such that a girdle might be said about it. For if we shall believe this, he said that one who goeth west shall return out of the east, then shall it not also be that one who goeth ever east shall come up at last behind the west, and yet break no ban? But Arbazan said, It may be so, yet naught was said of how long the girdle might be. The radius of the earth might be huge, dude, and mayhap the width of the world is such that a man would wear the whole of his life if or ever he encompassed it. And I deem it for a truth that we have been set for our health and protection most westward of all mortal men, where the land of those that do not die lies upon the very edge of sight, so that he that would go round about from Anadune must needs traverse well nigh the whole girdle of the earth. And even so it may be that there is no road by sea. And it has been said that at that time he guessed aright, and that ere the shape of things was changed... And here again, we're talking about the changing of land masses, not about the changing of the of the, uh, geomet the geometric size of the, or shape of the world. Eastward of Anadune, the land stretched in truth from the north, even unto the uttermost south, where our ice is impassable. So they can't do the end around because not because you can't because uh, the world isn't round, but because it's not navigable. You got to find the Northwest Passage, right? You you can't do it. Um, you you run into there's no Panama, right? You you go east and you're just going to hit land, right? Middle Earth, the Great Lands stretch all the way from the north to the south. So yeah, no circumnavigating the globe possible. It turns out, right? And I love I love, um, uh, uh, Arbazan. Uh, his counter argument, right? Um, Arbazan, of course, is Amundil, right? Um, Elendil's dad. Arbazan says, "Well, we could do that, but that would be really stupid, right? Because we're like right next to Valinor right now, right? So to get there the other way, we have to go all the way around the world, and it's about like ninety nine percent of the way around the world, right? And Probably we're not going to live to make it to the other side, right? One way and the other. So, uh, yeah, yeah. Anyway, um, uh, 
I love the fact that they talk about this. And again, it's it's pretty clear that the the roundness of the world is. But notice how he's dealing with the roundness of the world differently here. Right. Um, And notice also we don't have the promise of the world's flatness in the same way here. Right. Um, uh, Nor are they thinking of it as a prison. We're not there yet either. Um, I mean, part of Arbizan's argument is that the world is so vast that maybe it would take more than your entire lifetime to get around to the other side. So conceptually, maybe a prison, but in practice, not actually very prison-like. Okay. The last... Yeah, hey, last slide. For now, having the ear of men, Zigur, with many arguments, gainsaid all that the Avaloi had taught, and he bade men think that the world was not a circle closed, but there lay many seas and lands for their winning, wherein was wealth uncounted, and still should they at the last come to the end thereof, beyond all lay the ancient darkness, and that is the realm of the Lord of all, Arun the Greatest, who made this world out of the primeval darkness, and other worlds he may make and give them in gift to those that serve him, and darkness alone is truly holy, he said and lied. Once again, Sauron does assert the dark myth of the flat world, right? But notice, I, I am really interested in the addition that he makes here, right? Um, the way that I read the first one, that is, the world is flat. And it's super huge. And there are totally lands for you to conquer still and be richer and more powerful, right? And beyond that is the darkness, which is the source of the world, right? Sounds to me almost like a promise of elevation, of ascension, right? Once you've conquered the world, then you can move into, then you like will become worthy and you'll get to the edge and you'll come to the darkness. And that's like where the real stuff is. Right. Once you get to the darkness, you will see that the stuff of the world, you know, right, the conquering of the world is this like chump change compared to the darkness, which is the source of all these things. The richness of the world is great, but the richness of the darkness is infinite. Right. Um, is on a completely different level because the richness of the world is derivative of it. That seems to be the message of Sauron. Uh, and the lord of that richness is uh, is uh, Melico. Right. Now, um, what he promises is exponential, but it's on the same kind of plane, right? Uh, sort of to use the, to avail myself of the geometric metaphor. Um, Arun the Greatest, when you get to the edge, when you have finished conquering this world, you will confront the ancient darkness. You will come to the edges and you will be face to face with the ancient darkness. And what will happen? Exactly. Darkness, the final frontier. Exactly, Matthew. Um, um, once you get to um, the edge, you will encounter Aaron, the greatest, and other worlds he yet may make and give them in gift to those that serve him. Right. So once you finish conquering this world, he'll give you other planes to conquer other worlds, other lands. Right. He doesn't seem to be promising them a kind of ascension. Right. You will become like gods in the darkness yourself. Um, but you will uh, basically the world is functionally infinite because Aaron can keep building new ones and giving them to you. Right. If you serve him. Um so it's in its way, I think, a more, um, it's a little bit more devious. The lie is much more focused on, and therefore you should really worship, um, not, I was about to say Meliko, you should really worship Aaron, the greatest, right? Um, yeah, so similar, but we can see that developing. All right, um, those are the things I wanted to emphasize about the second version of The Drowning of Anadune. We'll get the notes on the third version, the, the next set of revisions on that, and then we'll look at the uh, the theory of the work, uh, right, uh, that section afterwards. And then one or two things, maybe, about the Adonaic language. 
And that's going to be it. Next week should be our final session on Sauron Defeated. Uh, I know we've kind of stretched out things with the Notion Club papers, but uh, um, but we're almost to the end of the book now. So I look forward to uh, completing this next time, and then we'll get ready for Wizard of Earthsea, our next book. Uh, so... Uh, thanks. And uh, yeah, please do remember if you uh, if you have made a donation, please do send an email to the do- the email that's on the page right there. Donate at signumu.org in the bottom right hand corner of your screen. Um, uh, that's where you should send your email to get added to the list uh, of uh, uh, for our drawings there. Thank you very much, everybody. I will see you guys next week. Bye now. The Mythgard Academy has been offering in-depth discussions of awesome books and films since 2013, completely free to attend and free to download. If you've enjoyed our discussions and would like to help them continue, please consider donating at signumuniversity.org fund.